Good evening, everyone. Uh, hi, thanks very much for coming. We're delighted you could come here for Open Records 101. My name is Chris Satulo. I'm the Vice President for News here at WHYY, and welcome to the Lincoln, Digital, Lincoln Financial Digital Studio. We're delighted to have uh, a great group of experts uh, in the realm of government records and transparency and accountability here. The flow of the evening is first, um, we're going to have a speaker from the Sunlight Foundation, Bill Allison, who I'll introduce a little more thoroughly in a second. Um, and then we're going to have a panel discussion led by Dave Davies, who's the senior writer here at WHYY and Newsworks. On the panel will be Terry Mutchler, Executive Director for Open Records of the State of Pennsylvania, Mark Pfeiffer, who is an activist for open government in New Jersey, and Holly Otterbein, who's a reporter here at WHYY and at the Daily News, um, and Bill Allison from Sunlight Foundation will also be on the panel. Uh, now let's get um, the event started. Um, we begin, as I mentioned, with Bill Allison from the Sunlight Foundation. He'll tell you a little bit more about the work of the foundation, but it's been doing amazing work around transparency and making public records available and understandable to the public. Bill has a very long uh, history as an investigative enterprise journalist around government. Among his stops was here at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where we worked together for a few years. After that, he was at the Center for Public Integrity, and he's now editorial director at the Sunlight Foundation. So without further ado, Bill Allison. Hi, thank you all uh, for having me here. Um, let me just say about the uh, brief introduction of the Sunlight Foundation. We're about 45 brilliant people and me working in Washington, DC. Most of the Sunlight people are technologists, developers, um, the work, working through Sunlight Labs. And uh, some of the sites we do, sunlightfoundation.com is where you can find everything. We have a site called influenceexplorer.com that has federal and state campaign finance data federal lobbying data, federal contract and grant data, and tries to bring together in one place both the inputs into the political system in terms of influence and the outputs in terms of what groups get out of it. Uh, another, we, um, we both try to work with government. We have a large policy shop to make it more transparent, and we also try to do transparency to government. We have a reporting group that does investigations of Congress and the executive branch, uh, with some state stuff as well. So. That's Sunlight. We've been around since April of 2006. We opened our doors. Um, so I wanted to talk about FOIA. Um, and some way, in some way, I've been doing FOIA requests for probably about 20 years um, now. And I wish I could say that I had figured it out. I almost feel like I'm a case study of what not to do sometimes. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why Sunlight's official, unofficial position on the FOIA law is that we shouldn't have them. We shouldn't need them. The presumption of government should be to release information and release data to the public. I mean, we pay for this stuff. The work product of government affects citizens. Uh, government records should be available online. And you sh it shouldn't be the onus put upon the citizen or the journalist to go out and find this information. Uh, the onus should be on government to release it and make it public and make it available. And a lot of our uh, policy work is trying to get government to be more open. One of the reasons, though, that that's difficult is that government records are pretty, pretty messy. This is actually something that the National Security Archives, a great group in Washington, DC, that probably does more FOIAs in a day than I've done in my life, uh, uncovered. This is Richard Nixon's application to be, a, I believe, an FBI agent, um, a G-man. And uh, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of information redacted. And one of the things about government record keeping systems, that, and I think this is one of the central things that makes the Freedom of Information Act uh, process so slow, cumbersome, uh, and difficult is that government has all kinds of legacy systems where they've intermingled data that can't be released with data that can be released. And this is true of documents. This is true of, of databases. Uh, when the government put out something called usaspending.gov, uh, which was uh, the signature legislative accomplishment of Barack Obama when he was a senator from Illinois, it was co-sponsored by Tom Coburn, a very conservative Republican. And the idea was to put all government spending data, loan data, and whatnot uh, online and available for the American public to inspect. Well, they found out that some Department of Agriculture loan programs used as part of the reference number for each loan, the unique record identifier, the last part of it was the social security number of the farmer who had applied for the money. 
And when they started doing this, this was back in the 1950s, I believe, that this program began. When they started doing it, of course, there was no internet, there was no real databases, there were no, and there was no reason to think that there would be anything wrong with, and there were no credit cards, and there was, you know, there was no reason why releasing a social security number like that would be a bad thing. When usaspending.gov went up, suddenly there are, you know, literally tens of thousands of social security numbers floating around the web. They had to pull the data down. They had to change their naming um, uh, system or, or numbering system and then reload the data. So this is one of the things that slows down getting the information. But if you did have all this information online, you could get it much quicker and you'd have much more, many more eyes to look at it. And that obviously is a good thing. Um, when you do have to make a FOIA request, which we still do qu quite a bit, I have a number that are outstanding that I'm very unhappy that I haven't gotten them yet. Um, the magic words that I always use to begin a Freedom of Information Act, uh, Act request, I mean, it's as simple as it's pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act. I like to put in the five US code, section 552, just to show that I know how to make that little squiggly line character on my keyboard. And then I am writing to re write request the following records, and that's it. And then I describe the records that I want, and then I you know, end usually with a, a little additional language. Sometimes I ask for a fee waiver. I think it's going to be a lot of money because we're a nonprofit. Sometimes I ask for expedited processing, but that's really the gist of it. Although one variation on that, and the only thing different about this, at the very end it says, in electronic format. And when you're requesting databases, and I'll go into this a little bit more, uh, it's critical that they ask for them in an electronic format because otherwise you get pieces of paper and that's a lot harder to use. Um, and then one last big block of text, and this is one of the things that you should really take the time to get to know your Freedom of Information Act law. Uh, this is from the U.S. Code, uh, and this is from a FOIA request that I recently issued, um, and I mentioned getting paper. Um, agencies, and this is true in New Jersey and Pennsylvania too, are supposed to give you the records in the format you ask for them if that's the format you keep them in. And one of the reasons why this is so important is, is that you know, I, I belong to a list called the National, uh, uh, National Association of Computer, wait a minute, NICAR. Um, uh, it's the Computer Assisted Reporters Association, and I can't remember what NI stands for, which if Mark Horvath were here, it would kill me. But anyway, NICAR on the list, you will always, you know, every once in a while somebody will send out an email saying that I just got records in PDF format that I know the agency keeps in data format, and now I can't work with them, and I have to convert them from PDF, and I'm furious that they won't give them to me. Well, most state laws and the federal law require them to give you in the format they keep them in. And that can be incredibly valuable. So knowing your FOIA law will really help you out when you do this. Um, this is the form for Pennsylvania, so you don't actually have to do the uh, quoting the code. I mean, it's available in several different formats online. And New Jersey has a, something very similar. It's kind of specific agency by agency. If you want data on the, or information from the Department of Corrections, you go to that site, uh, New Jersey Gov, the OPRA, and choose Department of Corrections and you get this form and you can submit your request and get your uh, and get the process started. Now some of the basics of the FOIA law and some of the problems with it are you have to ask for things that actually exist. You cannot request from say the Department of Education, I would like a um, book report on Herman Melville at a ninth grade uh, level with enough spelling errors to fool my teacher that she'll think that I actually wrote it. Uh, that won't work. They're not required to create a record for you, but they do have records that they keep, so you have to know that the records actually exist. A second thing is making sure you send it to the right agency or the right place. If you send something to the Secretary of Defense's office and what you really want is information from the Air Force, it's going to be a much slower process, and you may just get back a response saying that we have no responsive records, and then you, you think, oh, well, I'm just not going to get it, and you give up. Um, I've found there's a two schools of thought that you don't want to give a lot of specificity in a request. You want to be kind of vague so that they don't no, you don't tip your hand that you know you know about this great document. Uh, and maybe because I'm getting older and I have less time left, but I feel like you know the more specific I can be, uh, that's what I want to do. Although sometimes you do have to go on a fishing expedition. You don't know you know that they have some records. You don't know what you can't specify them. You don't have a date. You don't know if it's correspondence. You don't know if it's a report. And so you have to find language to do that. And one of the th tricks I always use is I'm asking for records, including but not limited to correspondence, emails, reports, and I have like a list of 72 nouns that goes after that um, that refer to X, Y, or Z. But that's really the catch-22, is that if you don't know something is out there, how do you know to ask for it? 
you know, these guys obviously sitting in this old picture from the Social Security Administration deal. Um, so, and I'm repeating a few reports here that, you know, the agencies won't make you the special report and have to know something exists. Data is a little bit different because, because things are kept in databases, it's almost like you're asking for a, a specific report. Uh, let's say that you know that your state agency keeps a record of all state-owned vehicles and their mileage and keeps it by department. You know, you're tipped off that, uh, or you have a sense that somebody in the, um, say, um, uh, the Justice Department is abusing, that, you know, that lawyers in the Justice Department are abusing, or the State Attorney General's Office, I should say, are abusing the car privilege. So you can ask for cars with mileage over uh, 1,000 miles a year or 10,000 miles a year uh, just for the Justice Department and get that sliver of data. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, electronic records are so much easier to query and so much better to get uh, when you can get them. But you know, obviously what you don't want to do when you're making a request is ask for photographic evidence of Bigfoot's existence. That gets you back into that trap of, of asking for something that doesn't exist, something that the agency doesn't have. But if you're asking for reports, letters, emails, et cetera, that mention Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever, you're more likely to get it. If you're foying the parks department, let's say, I'm sure there are campers uh, in the national park system who have reported seeing Bigfoot. So some tips for finding out what data is available. Um, record retention rules, every state agency has some kind of record retention rule that they keep. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to FOIA it or make an Open Records Act request, but find out how long they keep records, and then you know what records they're keeping. So that's a very useful thing that to do, and ask for this, the agency's record retention rules. Another thing, you know, go on the website and see what forms they collect. For the federal government, there's a website called forms.gov that has all kinds of different forms that the government, they're all approved by the Office of Management and Budget. So you can see all these forms and you know what data each agency is collecting. And so then you can request those records. Um, don't ignore the human element. Talk to people. Um, uh, I'll get into this a little bit later, but we found out uh, when talking to the Defense Department about some earmark work we were doing that they had a database of correspondence with members of Congress. And so as soon as we found out they had that database of correspondence with members of Congress, we FOIA'd it um, because that's what we, you know, we wanted to see. And then the last thing is, you know, a lot of times on agency websites, especially when they're changing from one database to the other, but even if they're not, um, uh, or record keeping systems, they will have PowerPoints, whatever, explaining how to use the system. And that can give you a lot of insight into, you know, these are training materials that they put up. And this will give you a lot of insight into how the agency is keeping the records and what records they're keeping. And that can help you a lot too. Now a brief interlude, um, you know, we had the Open Government Initiative, which Sunlight was incredibly happy was it announced and not so happy that on the follow through. Uh, every agency has its open government plan, and this is something from the Department of Homeland Security's open government plan, which is about a 60 or 70 page document that's online in PDF format. And they say that, that one of the things they're going to do is make a list of all of their data sets. They've already cataloged 900. They're going to catalog the last 300. So in one place, in one document, you'll have a list, and this is collections of documents, this is structured data, this is you know, everything that they keep, every record they maintain. If you have this master file, you can find out everything that the Department of Homeland Security, the uh, ICE, all of the sub-agencies keep, the copyright folks, enforcement folks. So this would be fantastic to have as a reporter, but the best thing about it is that it's secret. Even though it's in their open government plan, they are not going to release this information to the public. Um, we FOIA'd it anyway. We haven't been turned down yet. We haven't been, uh, we haven't obviously been granted it yet. I'm still hopeful that we're going to get it, but, um, you know, but this is sort of the problem and again, illustrates the catch-22. I mentioned something a little bit about data and that uh, Department of Defense database of congressional correspondence. And um, I guess in 2007, I had this crazy idea that one of the things about members of Congress that we don't know and that we don't track, Sunlight began by really focusing on Congress much more than the executive branch. Um, one of the big things members of Congress do is constituent service, but we have no way to measure how effective they are, how often they do it, uh, com to compare offices, to see what patterns there are. There are some members that write particularly to, say, the, um, you know, the black lung judges, there actually are. 
Uh, are there some that focus, and obviously they're from coal states. Are there, you know, but we wanted to see what patterns there were, and, and were there offices that didn't do any constituent services, uh, or if there were ones that went above and beyond their duties. So we started FOIAing every single federal agency for their correspondence logs with members of Congress. I didn't do this, actually, uh, uh, Anunaran Swami, who joined us uh, just a few weeks at that point and didn't know enough to tell me when I had a crazy idea, was the one who actually had to FOIA and fight with 100 and some FOIA officers every week to see if we could get this information. But this is what we got from the Department of Defense, and we requested it electronically. What they did, they had this great database. They printed out the pages of the database. They took pictures of it and made TIFF files. And then they sent it to us, and that is actually, well, you can't really see it. It was about the size when you print it out of a, uh, about a five by eight index card. So when you blew it up to eight and a half by 11, the characters became these hairy letters that uh, were just about impossible to, to read. And you know, so obviously we had hundreds and hundreds of pages of this, absolutely useless to do any kind of data analysis on it. And this is one of the things, again, with FOIA, that you have to fight with government agencies. But we weren't going to let this go. We ran these pages through a program called OCRAD, which is kind of a freeware. It runs on Linux. Uh, Scott Wells, who is our office manager, but everybody at Sunlight has amazing talents, was the one who actually did this for us. And you know, we came up, it's, it's clear as mud. It's pretty garbled. Um, you know, there's weird things like requests to the QU would, would come out as an AU, lowercase. Uh, Iraqi came out, the Q and I came out, AI, lowercase, and there are a whole bunch of other weird things that happen with this. Uh, so then we use a program called Text Wrangler to try to clean this up, and I was very grateful to have, having been an agate clerk at the Philadelphia Inquirer because there was an awful lot of change commands and an awful lot of fixing things. And eventually we were able to convert it to Excel. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty close, and then we proofread it and scrubbed it and cleaned it and plugged it into a program that IBM has online called Many Eyes, which lets you visualize things. And we could see that the things that members of Congress were most often writing to the Pentagon about at the height of the Iraq war were congressional travel and travel requests. I mean, this isn't quite scientific, but this allowed us to analyze the data. And then we were able to write a nice little story about it and put it up online and share the data with everybody. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can share data uh, like this, and especially if you're a citizen. Uh, there's a program called Scrib D. We actually use it in a site we do called Political Party Time that tracks fundraisers for members of Congress, and we post the invitations online. We put them into Scrib D. Uh, this is a case of Sunlight doing transparency to them because members of Congress do not have to disclose when they have a fundraiser, when they're meeting with lobbyists, or when they're sitting down with people who are writing them $5,000 checks, but we try to make that information public. And there's also a program called Socrata that Sunlight uses that you can, uh, so again, freely available, and you can post uh, data online with that. So the one reason I belabored this point about getting electronic data in electronic format is that this is a page, and I have thousands of them sitting on my desk, of uh, data from the Department of Justice about fines paid by, or sorry, lawsuits against companies that have been uh, won by the Justice Department with the judgments and the infraction and everything else. And as you can see, it's once again clear as mud. And I'm currently having a fight with them over getting this in electronic format. And when I do get an electronic format, I'm going to repaper the uh, powder room in our basement with this, these documents, put them to a use, useful use. So just a few last tips. Um, always save your correspondence with agencies. That will save you a world of heartache. Um, uh, one of the big problems that I've been finding with uh, the federal government and how they're doing FOIA now. They have these e electronic portals that you send off your FOIA and you don't get a receipt back, you don't get anything. I cut, I, you know, before I hit send on that, I save the, the text and I put down the date and everything so I have it. Um, I still use snail mail sometimes if I really don't trust an agency's portal. Um, uh, and then, all you know, I engage in negotiations with FOIA officers and with people in agencies all the time because it, it does end up being a process. Uh, I keep a log of these contacts so that I know who I've talked to because if you have multiple FOIA requests out, it's not so easy. Um, the next one, be polite, is just kind of standard common sense. But you know, one of the things to remember about FOIA is it's not the best funded operation in the government. Sometimes you're dealing with contractors or people who are not necessarily government officials. Uh, who may not know very much about what's going on and are just trying to fulfill their job. Uh, it's better to get uh, them on your side. And the last thing is don't be afraid to assert your rights when you, um, uh, you know, are dealing with an agency that keeps trying to tell you that, no, they don't have to give you electronic records or that they don't have to answer your request or 
uh, et cetera. Uh, some resources, this is a site that Sunlight actually did give startup money to called muckrock.com and actually lets you keep track of your FOIA requests um, and it's, you can set up an online account and they're really helpful with uh, the FOIA process and it helps you with both state and federal FOIAs. Um, a new site that went online for, from the federal government, uh, foiaonline.regulations.gov. This is something that um, was just debuted uh, yesterday as part of Sunshine Week. And uh, it has a lot of really useful information, including you can see like they post documents that other people have gotten. Uh, so you can see uh, sort of the information that folks have gotten. And it can also help you get, um, there's like sample request language that you can take a look at uh, to help you. And this is done in part by the Office of Government Information Services. Miriam Nesbitt is the person who's running it. It's out of the National Archives, but they are your FOIA ombudsman at the federal level. You can contact them and get them to help you with a request. I was just talking to her today. Uh, uh, they have a log of, of customer help that they put up, and the average response time when they are trying to help somebody with a FOIA delay is about 79 days. So even when they're trying to get you an answer on a delay, it can take a long time. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Pennsylvania Freedom Information uh, Coalition. And I'd be remiss also if I didn't mention the New Jersey Foundation for Open Government, and of course, many other sources on state and uh, federal filing. And that's it. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I noticed with interest uh, something about a guy got information from from one place with, through the Freedom of Information Act and it was like it was like fifteen banker box full of of paper, right? Well who pays for that paper? Do they the you know, you said that with it, as a nonprofit you don't have to pay for it or do you have to pay for it? Well something? it depends. Uh, and a lot of times they won't give us uh, fee waivers, but um, sometimes agencies do charge you for um, re, um, getting the information. Um, agencies are different. Uh, you know, I get really mad when they say that I have to specify how much I'm willing to pay ahead of time when I don't know how much I'm going to get. Um, but, um, but, you know, sometimes you do have to pay, and even, you know, news organizations occasionally have to pay. Um, and, you know, my sense, though, is, is that if the records were kept better and in better shape, you know, particularly with data, but also paper records, uh, you know, because a lot of that is redacting. Uh, there are a bunch of exemptions to FOIA, one of which is a commercial, it's, um, um, you know, business information, um, proprietary business information that they're not allowed to release. And so there's a review process where they have to involve a company if you're FOIAing information, say, from a government contract that they will have a chance to look at it, and that makes it slower. And so you end up getting charged for a whole bunch of research and other fees. And if you go to, uh, there's a site called fbo.gov, which is the federal, federal government's basically asking for, um, you know, contractors to do things. There's a lot, if you put in FOIA, you'll find a lot of contracts where it'll say up to like 70 or $80,000, and that's usually some big lawsuit where they're gonna have to go through thousands and thousands of agency records for, you know, whether it's EPA regulations or whatever, as part of a FOIA suit. And, you know, and, the, and again, you'll see um, dollar amounts of uh, anywhere from seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 to a million dollars. That's generally not journalists doing that. I mean, again, that's generally some kind of lawsuit or corporate interest that's pushing for that. So, uh, and a lot of times, you know, the taxpayers do pick up the tab for it. And again, this is one reason why if government systems were designed better, and that's one of the things that you know a lot of people are working on at the federal level now, um, it would be much easier to release this information, and it wouldn't cost nearly as much, and technology can help a lot with reducing those costs. 
Hi, thank you very much. Um, I guess if you do a really good open government record request, uh, one indicator that you did a good job is that they'll say no. And so <laughs> I think that I was going to ask you that, do you think really for regular citizens, because this is what we, our parents group has run up with in terms of asking the school district for information, is that they pr very often say no, they cite legal reasons why, and then it's up to us to go to the open records office on appeal. And on that case, my question to you is, we've needed lawyers because we just can't, we, we don't understand the law well enough to counter what they're saying, I guess. And so I would ask you if you felt like that was something that people should keep in mind. Um, I mean, it's a problem because you will always run into recalcitrant government officials and you'll always run into people who will say no. And again, one of the big um, you know, problems with this is, is that if you don't release something, there's no chance you'll be embarrassed. There's no chance your boss will be screaming and hollering, why did you give this out? You're making us look terrible. Um, and, you know, and I think that this is a real weakness in the FOIA process. I mean, my, my proposal is, is that if they deny a FOIA request that should be fulfilled and you had to hire attorneys, they have to pay for it and they have to take it out of the agency's conference budget or the, um, you know, the entertainment budget for the, for the group so that it really, you know, has an impact. Uh, but, uh, but barring that, um, you know, and this is a problem with FOIA, there are cases uh, when I was at the Center for Public Integrity, we sued for a database that the Justice Department told us would be destroyed if they tried to download the data. And it was a long, drawn out lawsuit. It took several years. We finally got the information, and this is a true story. They gave it to us on a hard drive, which when we plugged it in, caught fire. So we had to get it a second time. It was actually a fault with the disk. It wasn't the data that caused that to happen. But, uh, and we sued for attorney's fees for that one because it what did involve a lot of staff time and a lot of, uh, and you know, we did have somebody who was helping us pro bono, but we also had somebody that was, we were paying. And, um, and for the life of me, I had left by that point, so I can't remember if we ever managed to get attorney's fees, but you can, um, you know, it's hard to recover attorney's fees from states and, you know, but this is, again, this is a problem with the law. I mean, um, does, do you have an ombudsman who can help with that kind of thing? Boy, I mean, you know, the, um, and I think that the National Freedom of Information Coalition isn't quite as around anymore. I mean, Public Citizen does some pro bono stuff, but it's mostly at the federal level. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, I mean, that's really, I mean, unfortunately, you're, you're kind of based, you're kind of reduced to charity if you don't have the resources to get a good lawyer. And um, let me think about it. There may be something and um, um, Talk to me afterwards, and I'd be happy to, to try to give you some ideas. But off the top of my head, I mean, I really don't have any great suggestions. And this is a problem we run into, too, where we're pretty sure we could prevail on if we challenged it in court. But resources are limited, and we really have to make a decision. Do we really want this data that much? So. One more question, and then we'll bring the panel up. Bill will be on the panel, too, so he can, if you have any more questions for him. Hello, my name is Michael Burnside, and I don't know exactly how to phrase this correctly. It's a more generalized question instead of a specific one. And it starts with information being power, and obviously people not wanting to spread power around, wanting to keep it for themselves. And it's not only the individuals who use Freedom of Information Act. Obviously, if I was working for a corporation, I could, or a foreign government, I could, or whatever the case is. So what incentive is there for people not to be rude, but I'm going to pick on you, to pay your salary. You're, you're picking on this group saying, give me power, give me information, and I'm just going to put it on the web and give it to everybody. Are people like you a shrinking breed that's going to die out in 20 years? I mean, is everything going to be restricted at one form or another soon? I mean, at some level, everything's confidential, particularly if you do economics. I mean, you know, I think what, in that context, what kind of worries me most is what's happened to the news industry, because traditionally it was the news industry, uh, which, you know, only a few years ago was much bigger, um, and you have fewer and fewer professional journalists doing this. And I, one of the things that we find is, is that you really do need a set of eyeballs on this data and somebody who's going to take the time, or this information, documents, whatever, take the time to get to understand what it means and also talk to human sources. I mean, you know, the government information is one thing, but you really have to spend some time going through it to figure out what it all means. And I think that that's really the worrying trend. I mean, you know, the nonprofit sector actually has been growing in terms of its 
um, approaches in this area. You have you know, Sunlight Foundation, Center for Public Integrity, Center for Investigative Reporting out in California. Um, there's a whole bunch of localized nonprofit news organizations. Um, certainly you have, uh, you know, uh, PBS and National Public Radio that have been around for years. So there has been public support for this kind of work. Um, there's also like a growing developer community. I and mean, one of Sunlight's most interesting state, uh, sites is something called openstates.org, which was a group of basically volunteer developers and a few Sunlight staffers who have learned how to scrape every all 50 state legislative resource sites and make them much more searchable, user-friendly, and easy for people to get. And that was largely done by volunteers. So in the developer communities, there's, there's a huge amount of interest in making government information more accessible. I think what we're lacking is the, the sort of the, the journalistic end to take that information and get useful, you know, to boil it down and get it to a point where you know, my mom can take a look at it and understand what it means. I mean, she's not going to spend a lot of time on a site like OpenSecrets.org, which has great campaign finance data, but she will read a story in her local newspaper that says that her member of Congress is doing X, Y, and Z, and uh, and that's you know that's good or bad. Well, these lights are bright. Can everybody hear us? Let's hope so. Um, thank you so much, Bill. You know, I, anyone who wants to look at what their city or county government or school district or local police department will often have to deal with regulations that are governed by state law. And so we have with us today experts in state law in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, as well as Holly, Holly Otterbein, who's done a lot of great work here with uh, public information requests in Philadelphia. Um, about a year and a half ago, there was something called the State Integrity Investigation, which was conducted by, it was a, a uh, collaboration of the Center for Public Integrity, Global Integrity, and Public Radio International, as well as many other public radio stations, including WHYY. And what they did was they, they hired a state, experienced state house reporter for each of the 50 states and had them look at a very, very long list of specific topics that relate to how well states function in areas of integrity, and one of them was accessibility to open records, and it was interesting. Uh, New Jersey ranked very high overall in integrity, surprisingly to a lot of people, but um, when it came to public records, uh, they got a B minus, and, and both in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, what, th what the reporters found was that in theory, the laws were terrific, things were very public, in practice, not so much, particularly when there was an issue and you had to appeal. So, Terry Mutzler, I'm going to turn to you first. Terry Mutzler is a former uh, journalist for the Associated Press and is the first and only executive director of the Pennsylvania Office of Open Records. The Open Records Law was passed in 2008, right, Terry? Uh, this was when Ed Rendell was governor, and the headlines were, at last, there is a presumption now that records are public rather than uh, a requirement that you try and prove they are public. Um, practically speaking, how well does it work? Tell us how your office functions in, in getting people access to what they need. Uh, in some ways very well, uh, but in other ways we are dealing with uh, one of the, uh, you know, just a, a sea change of attitude where public officials still don't like the public. It's about as plain as I can be in that regard. Um, the Office of Open Records, since we opened our doors in 2009, we just are issuing our annual report for Sunshine Week. We've had an 89% increase in the number of appeals that have come to the Office of Open Records. We so opened our doors. This is a doors. case where someone has been denied a record. Yes, and, and they come, come to, to you. Right, exactly. Appeal and so, and then we uh, we review. We have 20 business days. Big distinction. We're actually one of the very few states that have a time frame on a turnaround for a determination that a record is public. We have to issue that decision in 20 business days. And in most states, as you can see, you know, as you probably know, some take years to do that. But the reality is when we opened our doors, we had 1,059 appeals. Just this past year, we had 2,188 appeals. That does not count the 200 cases that we handle in the Supreme Court, Commonwealth Court, Court of Common Pleas, the 20,000 inquiries to our office. 
the mediations and hearings, and we do it with six lawyers and one chief counsel. Um, it's, it's, we still see, uh, the plainest way I can say what we see is we see an extreme. There are members of the public and members of the media who are convinced that every public official is a criminal, but on the flip side of that extreme, you have public officials that don't like the public. One of the most stunning things that I've seen, I just saw in the last week, and we'll move forward with this, the, to the person that asked about lawyers and needing lawyers. Um, reporter in Reading files a right to no request seeking records from the city. He is denied and he appeals to the Office of Open Records in one of the most stunning uh, attempts to block an appeal the city of Reading filed a letter with our office asking us to dismiss the appeal as they felt that this reporter was engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. Wow. And so, um, with but, that, I'll, I'll pass the mic but and to, uh, but let you know. A couple more uh, things on you know. what you're up to. to. But just to come back to basics. In a case where someone in Pennsylvania seeks a record, yeah. they are denied the yeah. record. They can appeal to you, and then you have the ability to tell that agency, that yeah. county government, that city government, what? you have to give them the record. If they want to then refuse, it goes to court. Right, and, and really, believe it or not, Pennsylvania's laws, uh, you know, there is some components that I think weaken it, but in reality, there's a great one-two punch. You now have the presumption that the record is open, and you have the Office of Open Records that can issue binding decisions. So the basic way it works, you file a request for a record, you have a, uh, they have five days to, um, to respond to you. They can either grant the record, deny the record, or extend it for 30 days, which is usually the default position. At the end of the 30 days, they either give you the record, deny you the record. If they deny, they tell you you have a right to appeal and you come to us. And then we issue that decision and it's binding, uh, on, uh, it's binding on the agency. And then, of course, they do have the option of going to court. Um, and we see uh, of the probably 200 cases out of 6,000 that have gone to court, courts have upheld us in, in about 70% of the cases. Uh, that we, you know, some are dismissed, some, some they just overturn us outright. Um, and uh, we see a lot. The last piece is, uh, and again, it ties to this person's question. Unfortunately, in the past, when someone would appeal to us, if they just wrote appeal, we let them in the door. Court said, can't do that. If an agency denies you for five reasons and the citizen cites four, you don't get in the door. So you set up a situation where you have a citizen against the chief counsel. So we, you know, or, or a, you know, where you almost do need a lawyer in some ways. Um, we're pushing very hard. There's a lot of progress, but at the end of the day, um, the, sta the deck is stacked against the citizen. One more specific question before we move on. We heard Bill Allison say how important it is to be able to get records in electronic form if they exist. Does Pennsylvania law require an agency to provide it in that form if they have it? In the format that it exists, yes. And they're not required to create it, but they are required to, pr to produce it in the format in which it exists. Now, we did have a case early where uh, the Office of Open Records uh, issued a decision, sort of telling on myself here, and we said it was okay for the agency to release it in PDF format, and, and uh, don't attack me. This has but, been um, brought up. Yeah, it's a big yes. issue. And uh, anyway, we were overturned on that component, uh, and and the you know the, the the issues behind it were, you know, we saw examples of of folks that were not journalists but citizens who were manipulating information and you know for for uh, and releasing inaccurate information. And uh, it was one of our earliest uh, decisions on the PDF versus electronic format. Long and short is, the 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 law says that the citizen is able to obtain the information in the format that the agency maintains it. So the agency doesn't make that call, the citizen makes that call. Okay. Mark Pfeiffer, at your far right here, has had a long career in New Jersey government. He spent 25 years in the New Jersey Division of Local Government Services, and he was there when the New Jersey uh, um, Government Records Council, the appeals right. body for open records in, Pencil in New Jersey, was created, I think, in 2002. Two, right. Okay. I was involved in the, the whole startup, the legislation that was passed, the Oprah legislation passed at the end of the 2001 le legislative session, and I was tapped at, from my regular job to help to get the whole Government Records Council up and running and ran it for about a all year right, so, so you've seen this from the inside and from the outside. How well does it function? How open are records in New Jersey? I, I think if you, you started, you were looking where we were back in 2002 and where we are today, uh, everybody get, most people get it. Government, 
government officials get it, government employees get it, that government records are out there. There is a list of New Jersey records that are exempt from, from disclosure. By default, everything is open unless there is an, an, an exception for it. What we have now is when we get complaints in, in New Jersey, a citizen can either complain to the Government Records Council, which is free and no cost, or they can go to court. And we have some people that go to court. We have some folks that go to the, to the GRC itself. But at the end of the day, right now, what we're seeing is pretty much just outlier-type records, uh, people who are challenging if a government c records custodian says a record does not exist. When you're saying what you're saying, you mean the, the appeal what, body? What the, the appeal process, what, what the Government Records Council and the courts are now seeing, I think generally are outliers. There are always, are always exceptions. You're going to have some people that still don't want to buy into the fact that, okay, it's government records if they're supposed to be open. Government officials are not necessarily, government employees are not necessarily being evil when they deny records. You pointed out before, I think Bill did that, you know, sometimes they don't want to do, you know, their bosses don't want records released and, you know, they're not going to do anything that's going to tick their, their, their bosses off too much. And so the, the boss, boss makes that decision. Case, right. and, and, you know, but that's part of government in a sense. I mean, you do get that and at least we have a process that gets those issues worked out. Does... Does New Jersey require the agencies to release data in electronic form if it exists and if it is requested in electronic form? Yes and yes. And in, in fact, it goes a little bit further. The requester can ask it for it in a specific format. If the agency has mm -hmm. the capacity to convert it, they can do so. And they can also say, okay, if we don't have the capacity, we can do it, but it will cost us X to do it, and we'll pass that cost along to you, and if you want to pay for it, we'll get it done that way. Now, I have to say there was a remarkable couple of stories done a few months back by Matt Katz of the Philadelphia Inquirer about the New Jersey Government Records Council, in which he discovered that, astonishingly, the, the, the council would meet and everyone in the room, other than the members themselves, that is to say the members of the public in, in attendance as well as parties to the record in dispute, would not know even after the meeting what the decision had been. A silent vote would be taken. <laughs> he also noted yeah. Yeah. that all of the members were appointed by Governor Christie and that in cases where there was a challenge to a Christie administration agency refusing the record, the record was 44 and 0 in favor of those agencies. Is that a, is that a council that's really working? I think so. It's, yeah, I, I'm going to say yes, it, it, it does work. What you have there is a difference between process. And, and, you know, when we did the law back in 2001, we were kind of out on a limb. The legislature, there was a lot of, the legislature was going back and forth on it. There was a lot of debate. Nobody really thought about process and what the role of the staff was versus the role of the, of the council. And the determination was only the council could make a decision. The staff was not making decisions. They were just making recommendations to the council itself, and the council would decide. And there were attorney general opinions that said, well, you, the staff can't tell the public what the staff is recommending because it's an advisory issue at that point. The council has to make that decision first. But at the meeting, surely they can say what they're doing. In theory, yes. And I, you know, I can't speak for what was happening at that point, but it's clear, and, and I think Matt's article caught the attention of state legislators because now we do have amendments being considered by the state senate. It's up for vote in the state senate, I think, in sometime in the next couple of weeks of amendments to the Open Public Records Act that put some specific requirements on how the, the GRC will have to operate. I'll, I'll just say I spoke to Matt a couple of days ago because I, I knew we were gonna, this was going to come up, and he said that anybody who's serious about an appeal in New Jersey just simply skips the government records council and goes to court because they, it's just not going to it's not going to give you any real uh, serious you, you consideration. Can, you, you can go. You can reach that conclusion. However, for a citizen that you know that's got an outlier type question because remember what you're getting now after 10 years in, into the law government custodians have been trained they understand what the law is they've been banged around enough so they're generally producing the information so what you have are outlier issues outliers are tough they require a lot of investigation the council had one case where uh the the information was theoretically was argued to be by the agency what we call advisory consultative or or, or, or deliberative, which means it's not, it's, it's, it's not disclosed. The council and the council staff had to go in to review some 2,000 records and make a determination on each one whether they were, were disclosable enough. That takes time. There, there's, you get those situations, and yes, 
Those outliers do take a lot of, a lot of time to do. They take court's time, too. Right. Um, and I'm going to move on to Holly Audubon in just a moment. But a, a lot of what state open records laws govern is not just state agencies themselves, but subdivisions, counties, oh. townships, water and sewer authorities, school boards. Now, do they get it in New Jersey? I was at, most of my comments were referring to local government. A lot of the cases that we've been getting are local government authority type cases, county government cases. They get that. Municipal clerks are, are specifically re responsible in each of our now 565 municipalities for acting on the law to make sure that their, their agency complies. County governments work the same way. The authorities all have somebody in charge. They get it. What you wind up now is those requests that are odd, that are out of the ordinary, or if a record doesn't exist and somebody wants to, to challenge that. Holly Otterbein um, is a, a well-respected reporter here at WHYY and at the Daily News on the It's Our Money Project, and I know you spend a lot of time requesting public records from the city of Philadelphia. Do you have any particular, I don't know, tips or tricks, ways that people can get what they need? Sure, um, I'll say that Bill did an excellent job on tips and tricks earlier, and so, Anything that he mentioned, I would just uh, reiterate, and I actually had a few things written down that you had already said. Um, so just a couple things. Um, first, I'd say uh, don't bother with informal requests, um, and if you do decide to, um, make them brief. Uh, I recently made a request with a city office informally um, with, a, with a source who I trust, and I was told that you know, I should request it informally, that that would probably um, be the most successful way to do it, that uh, if the law department got to it, that it would, you know, have to work through this very lengthy process. And so I decided to do that. And um, it ended up taking, uh, well, it, first it was delayed informally for a month. And I, you know, I just kept being told, uh, we need another week, we need another week. Um, and then eventually after a month, I decided to make a formal request for it. Um, I was told, you know, first they get five days um, to respond to it. After that, they asked for an additional 30 days, and then they asked for um, two more requests after that passed. And so uh, I, I just got it a few days ago, and, and by that point, three months had passed. Um, so I'd say that if you want to try to make an informal request for the purpose of sort of maintaining sources and because you think it might be faster, do it a week at most. Um, and then secondly, I'd say uh, get to know if you are requesting records in Philadelphia specifically, and that's really all I can speak to because I cover city government here. Um, get to know Mark Head. He might be in the room right now, perhaps. Yep, there, he's the bald guy in the back there. Um, he's the city's first uh, chief data officer. That's his title and uh, only one, and he's just a great person to get to know um, if you've got questions about how data is structured or um, how to read certain data. I, I think he's a good advocate for citizens, and I know that he's also pushing behind the scenes to release data sets, and so if you feel strongly about a particular data set that maybe you're requesting with some frequency, I know um, one example for myself is I, I request uh, the Revenue Department's records on delinquent uh, property uh, owners on a pretty frequent basis and um, comb through them, you know, to look for government officials and uh, business owners and things like that. And so I've been, you know, pushing um, for that to be a regular uh, data release by the city because I know that a lot of other people are making it. And I think that, um, that a lot of folks in government are interested in releasing those data sets too because it's, um, you know, it's, it's beneficial for them because it takes a lot of work to, uh, you know, keep releasing these things over and over again. So there is an incentive there, and I know that the city has released a lot of data sets for that reason. Uh, they've, you know, released huge data sets from the licenses and inspections, um, police, and things like that. Uh, overall, uh, your honest opinion, how, 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 what kind of a grade do you give the Nutter administration on openness? Um, I, maybe a B minus, uh, if, if I'm going to give it a specific okay, grade. Okay, well, we just heard they're releasing lots of data. Where do, where do, the, where do the, de the demerits come from? Well, first I'll say the good things. Um, I really do give the Nutter administration high marks for releasing these huge data sets recently. Um, I mentioned the L&I stuff. I mean, 
it's just a ridiculous amount of records on, you know, everything from demolitions to, you know, uh, permits and licenses. Um, they also released a lot of information on uh, crime recently. And then I think the bravest data set that they did was um, they released uh, all of the records on the new property tax reassessments. And um, for anyone not from Philly, uh, Philly is in the midst of um, overhauling its property tax assessment system. And so they just reassessed every property in the city. And the city literally just released the whole data set online for anyone to get journalists, you know, everyday citizens, politicians who don't like, you know, the overhaul. Um, and I think that that, you know, I really give them high marks for doing that. Um, I, I think that the administration sometimes appears, or I worry that they um, either delay requests or deny them in, in not in good faith. Um, for instance, uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I, I made a request, um, well actually it was the one that I mentioned earlier that took three months, um, and that was, it's a somewhat sensitive request uh, because of the property tax overhaul that I mentioned, I'll just say it has to do with that. Um, and you know, I do worry that that was delayed um, because perhaps they didn't want it to be released in, you know, the same time period that all of these new assessments were coming out. Um, and another just specific um, example, um, the Inquirer a few years ago made a request for Mayor Nutter's daily schedule. Um, and the Office of Open Records, I believe, said that it was a public record, right, Terry? Yep. And, um, <coughs> and the administration has really fought it just really hard and um, and the courts I, I think have agreed with them um, for the most part and the administration has said that they don't want to release it because of a public safety concern that they think that um, uh, I guess somebody might be able to track um, you know where the mayor goes and that that poses a concern and I, I just have to say I think that's ridiculous uh, the mayor uh, the mayor's press office releases um, uh, you know, a schedule every single day to say where he is. Um, and not to mention, you know, there are many public officials out there in other um, states and at the federal level that have just voluntarily released their daily schedules. Right, um, well, they release the public schedule. It's the private schedule that's, that's really the argument here. Yeah. I mean, I will also note that, that the city of Philadelphia, it's been my experience that, as you said, there's no point in making an informal request because they will, re they will take the full amount of time that the law allows to respond to a written request, and they also require that the request be on a specific form, which is, I believe, Terry, it's the state right to know form. If you simply cite the law and send them an email, that will not entitle you to uh, the remedies under the law. So with the city, you better make the request in writing, you better make it with the right form, and you can expect them to take the full 35 days. Right, and the first time that they started um, that requirement, because it wasn't always like that, um, they waited the five days, you know, to respond to me and then said, this is denied because it's not in the right form. Yeah. So, um, you know, Bill Allison, you, you described a moment ago where situations where agencies in response to a request, request will clearly undertake bad faith delays or de deliberate actions designed to make the data inaccessible, like the, the case that you, I guess it was the Defense Department, mm -hmm. you said, who deliberately put a lot of effort into putting these records into these tiny little TIFF documents. Um, in a circumstance like that, is there any benefit to publicly embarrassing them? I hope so. Does anybody <laughs> care? <laughs> I, hope, I hope they cared. Um, I, you know, obviously publicizing it, I mean, I think it is good to point out when uh, an agency, I mean, you know, the problem with the Department of Defense is that there are so many other issues with them in terms of releasing information that this probably didn't cause anybody to lose any sleep. But, um, you know, I think at the local level, um, you know, the fact that, you know, I think there's always a good question to ask, are they hiding something? Or what are they hiding? Why won't they release these records? And I think that that's the kind of thing that certainly with the way that media has changed with with blogs, with um, you know the ability to kind of have journalists writing about their process a little bit more, I think that keeping up a steady drumbeat. It's been 370 days since I requested this, and they still haven't released it. Um, you know, almost like a hostage count. I mean, I think that that <laughs> does have an effect. Um, I mean, one reason reporters are reluctant to do that is what we just heard from Holly Otterbein. I'm not going to tell you what I'm working on. 
Uh, right. But at some point, it does seem to me, and, I, and I've had this debate in, in newsrooms in my experience, where you, you say to the editor, I want to nail these your, your guys because you know they, they've, they've deliberately thwarted this a access to this critical information. And, and one point of view among the editors is the public doesn't care about our problems. Um, it's an, I yeah. th and I think that that's where, though, some of the reporting comes in. Because if you know that these records exist and you have a pretty good idea of what's in them, then you can describe them. Uh, if you have a source who's told you about them, if you've done some background reporting, if you understand what the, uh, what the value of them would be to the public and why are they withholding this. And again, I mean, this happens a lot when um, you're getting closer to an election time and there's some mm -hmm. kind of ethics investigation going on and they're delaying the release of the uh, ethics investigation. Uh, that's the kind of thing that reporters will regularly write about. And I don't see why they shouldn't write about these other kinds of information they're trying to get as well. Terry Mutzler, how's uh, Tom Cor Corbett on openness, disclosure, transparency? Um, well, I will tell you, initially, uh, terrible. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, you know, you have, uh, you take a look at some of the cases. I, I, you know, I guess I have to say in advance, I'm sort of past the point of politeness with this stuff. But, um, you know, we had a, someone request a copy of the state constitution, and it was denied as not a public record. Okay, so let's start there. Um, it is improving, but uh, but l actually, let me say a few things more about that. Some wacky subversive so, just had to have this. But it gets uh, you know it gets complicated because um, and I, I just want to make one note. I would not give an agency uh, a week to do an informal uh, review. I'd give them two days because it it, it it's either going to happen or it's not. And you know you're already looking at 35 days unless you've dealt with the source for, you know, a long period of time. Uh, initially, when the Corbett administration uh, took office, I decided that uh, I had I was appointed by Governor Rendell, and uh, but the truth was, while he was very pro open government, I couldn't buy a vow from the Democrats, and so I thought when the new administration came in, I thought, wow, I'm going to send handwritten letters and ask them to meet with me so that we can start off on a new path, and. Uh, a lot of them canceled all on the same day. When I finally brokered a meeting with the administration, they said, well, Terry, we, we did get your letters, and we interpreted that as a spider inviting us into her web. It's the only time in public service <laughs> I almost cried. I, uh, but anyway, uh, but then, then after a series of being called a monster and a spider, as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, I went for broke, and I reached out to one person that I knew was a former reporter, and I thought, you know, maybe we can make some headway here, you know, share a beer, you know, and, uh, and I did make headway. And then, um, and then I built on that by dealing with someone who I find to be an extremely reasonable person there, um, uh, a woman named uh, Delene Lance Johnson, who's now sort of the head of the Right to Know uh, requests. And I can actually say between her and a few other people there, we've actually started some momentum and, um, and really uh, opened a line of communication that helps. But it's hard, it, first of all, it's difficult uh, because I'm in, a f in the fifth year of a six year term. It's difficult to answer that question in some ways, not, not difficult with the facts, but you take a look at some of the cases. The governor has also fought the release of his schedule uh, you know, you have government-issued Blackberries. I think I have one here somewhere. And uh, the telephone number with this, um, somebody asked for a copy of the telephone number of government-issued Blackberries, and they said they were personal, and therefore, because the law permits the withholding of a personal telephone number, they've withheld that. If you ask for an email address of a state employee, uh, they said that that was personal and not to be released. On the other hand, the governor's office is right in saying that in some ways they've released more government records than any other administration, and that's pri primarily due to the change in the law. And so I, it's, it started off extremely terrible and difficult. I think that we have, you know, we sort of all fell through the ice, and now we're sort of swimming for sure, but I think that we have made great strides, and I have high hopes that we will continue to be able to work with them to uh, uh, to have uh, a you know more access out there, one of the biggest issues that we are accused of is being an advocate, and and both administrations have accused us of the Office of Open Records of being pro uh, too pro citizen, and I I you know it's it's. <laughs>
It's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is, you know. It really is. Uh, Before, but, I want to move to audience questions, but it's interesting you, d you describe this, these personal approaches to members of the Corbett administration. It, are they moved by your charming personality or, and the notion that there's, it's no. the right thing to do? Or is it that, look, um, I don't want to go to court, but I will? No, I think that, uh, I think it's a couple of things. I think that, you know, I was on a panel recently with Judge Levitt at the Commonwealth Court and who used to work, I believe, at the insurance department. And she said that what they would do when, uh, if I have this right, I think it was insurance, forgive me insurance department if it wasn't them, but some state agency. She said when they would get a right to know request, uh, they used to refer to it as the right not to know. And that they would assign young lawyers as kind of a hazing, if you know, for my word, not hers, uh, you know, uh, how to deny the record, okay? So you have that tremendous philosophy there. I think that ultimately, quite candidly, what the Corbett administration uh, has come to see, and, and I've come to see, and I've learned a lot from them as well, is that the Office of Open Records isn't going anywhere, and just because someone in power says that it's not a public record, um, you know, we're gonna run it through those paces. And it is difficult sometimes to say to the governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, yes, you have to release this. Because you know you can see, as a former reporter, I can see what the end game is. Um, but the reality is I'm not there to make friends. I don't care who holds the records and I don't care who asks for the records. And that's the approach that we're gonna take. I don't know the reason. Uh, perhaps it was just a lot of, a, you know, a series of bad press and, uh, and, and, and it, you know, hopefully just, you know, reaching out to say, let's find common ground where we can do this without a great expense to the taxpayer because, you know, even if you go to court, it's costing money. And also a lot of times people, you know, even in this report that came out about us um, saying, you know, that, well, there's no, there's no teeth in, in the sense that there's no fines imposed. My theory on that, we don't impose the fines, but the courts do. It's the taxpayer that's paying the fines anyway. And so that's an issue. Let's let me get to some audience questions. We do have a little bit of time left. Um, does somebody have a mic? Uh, Chris, are you there? Uh, um, okay, why don't you just pick somebody and it's a little hard for me to see. Uh, so much a question is a, a perhaps a shameless plug. I, I'm, I'm the uh, vice president of the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition, and just wanted to uh, promote our website, paopenrecords.org, uh, and answer the question before about contacting an attorney. Uh, we have a uh, bulletin board up where you can post questions about the law. Contact us, and we will help you uh, find somebody who can answer your question and, and go through the OR process uh, and help you get into court. Okay. Useful for Helen Gamm. Yeah. I, I was told by a city planner that city council people have more power in this town than in other large cities. And I see that like when there's a vacant building that has $140,000 in back taxes, eight story building at Fifth and Master, that the guy must have been city council person's pet because he had it for a dollar, got it for a dollar in 2004. So my question is, have you ever asked uh, for freedom of information requests or whatever city council, particularly their schedules, because I'd like to know when they meet with these would-be developers, you know, speculators, whatever you want to call them. Um, I certainly have made requests with them, and I think that for the most part, uh, you know, they also score around a B. Um, I've made fewer requests, though, I will say, with city council than with the city. Um, I guess, would you like to comment on that anymore? I, I, haven't, I yeah. haven't requested schedules in particular. Um, no, oh, I will no. note, I believe that the inquirer uh, request was for city council members' daily schedules as well, and that they also fought that. And I, I um, read through um, some of the documentation behind that, and I remember, this is just a funny little um, side note, that uh, in particular, Councilman uh, Wilson Good said that he could not provide the daily calendar because apparently he doesn't keep one. Um, Which is... Believable, actually. <laughs> sort of. Um, but then when I actually got in touch with him, he said that that was not true. He never said that. And I, I asked him several times, well, yes or no, do you keep a daily calendar? And he never uh, answered that. Look, I want to ask each of you very quickly here. I mean, you three experts, because Holly, you, you're, you're on the reporting end of this. Is there, is there any communication or meeting that a public official has in the course of their business that, that they should be allowed to keep private? Do we have to know? Do we have to see every email? Do we have to know who they met with all the time? And I'm going to ask for a short answer because I do want to move along here. Bill Allison? If it's official, no. 
Nothing secret. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, national security. I mean, it's some things like that. But you know, uh, but generally speaking, I mean, I think that if you're having a public or if you're having a meeting where official business is conducted, you should be able to find that official out. Official business meaning I want to I want to tap on other senators' views on something that might lead to a compromise, but might, but might not. Um, a conversation, a drink, an email exchange, a phone call. Well, you know, it's funny because Florida's open records law um, or Sunshine Act. Uh, if two legislators sit down over coffee to discuss something, they have to, that has to be a public meeting. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, you can obviously go to extremes, but I think that the, the danger is that when you start carving out exemptions, you have people deciding, oh, if you're doing it over a drink, well, we will have the drunkest uh, government in the okay. country. <laughs> Ter Terry, quick comment on that from you. I disagree. I think that there are times when uh, to advance uh, public policy and government that there has to be some room. I think that there also has to be there has to be some room to have those meetings outside the eye of the public, at least initially. And uh, you know, and and eventually, of course, there has to be disclosure. Citizens own right. this yeah. government, yeah. but I think you can't if you make a if you if you make it so stark, you're not going to be able to move. Yeah, I mean, the Sunshine Law has some clear definitions. Yeah. There is such a thing as deliberations. Quickly, yeah. Mark Pfeiffer. I think I think yes. I think some of it is that where you're meeting with the public, where the public has an expectation of of privacy of what they're doing. One of the issues we saw early on, and I'm not sure exactly how it ended up, but people, you know, who have low-income problems, and they're asking their their government right. officials, their their elected officials, for help. In New Jersey, you know, for better or for worse, the legislature has exempted them from from the law, but not local council people. And there's a lot of the same issues there. And you know, it, it's constantly we've got a balance to make. We, we you know, open records 15 or 20 years ago was not, at the local level particularly, was not this huge issue because, one, people had a lot more confidence in their government. This part of this discussion is because we've lost, people feel they've lost control of their government, and what are our models for oversight? Our oversight models haven't worked well, and this is a new model for oversight. And, you know, democracy is going to be messy. It's never going to be a perfect thing. And as long as we have mechanisms that work our way through this, that's a good thing. Let me go to another question. Yeah, Chris, you want to? Um, yeah, um, I'm kind of interested in getting um, things like credit card receipts for restaurants and travel, and I'm wondering how successful you've been with um, getting those kind of receipts and if you have any suggestions um, for getting them from public officials. Good question. I yeah. have not made that request. I'm sure Terry's seen many of them. We though. see many of those. As a matter of fact, uh, one, uh, a city that was a distressed city financially, somebody filed a request and they discovered uh, they were able to obtain the credit card uh, bills to show how much they were spending in places like New Orleans and Orlando and uh, Sacramento and, and, on, and on, on trips. Uh, credit card receipts of a public official are public record. You should be able to obtain them. Uh, there could be, you know, the only place where you might see some haze on that is if a police officer, a detective or something has one um, and it's involving, you know, a confidential source, an informant, you know, perhaps, maybe. But as a general rule, you're going to get those financial records, and we've ordered those released, and they have been released in Pennsylvania. So the lieutenant governor going to an outing, every meal, every golf, that that on the if it's on, on a state card. credit card, you're going to you're going okay. to get most okay. of it. We, well, you should be able to get most. Yeah, of it. I, I will just say when I recently made a request of the mayor's travel vouchers, cards, etc., uh, I, I did not get that. I got a, a deliberately assembled uh, summary. Um, which, which really left out a lot of the Yeah, I, I can point out in Jersey, we don't have that problem at local level because we don't allow our, anybody to have credit cards. There you go. Okay, <laughs> another question. Uh, over here, yes. Uh, good evening. My question to the gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, in, in, um, in, the last, in, in the last governor uh, election, the governor of New Jersey, he, he actually uh, asked the, ask, ask the elector to borrow $500 million, uh, half a billion dollar, in order to, borrow, to, to protect, uh, to protect uh, some land in New Jersey. Actually, the, the, I, I, I did try to get uh, to, to understand the details of that transaction because, because it, it, it sound, it, it, the idea of borrowing money to protect uh, public land is kind of, is kind of counter, uh, counterproductive. In order to borrow money, you've got to have a collateral for this borrowing money, not to mention... Uh, anyway, uh, I was wondering if uh, public record for land ownership especially uh, such transaction that has been taking place by the governor of New Jersey, the recent one, is 
uh, accessible? Okay, let's just, uh, this is a very particular question about a circumstance. If, uh, Mark, if you're familiar I, with I'm it. Not, I'm not, not sure then, I am, but I, I can say, you know, any land transactions are all public. I mean, they're going to be recorded, you know, any land transaction is going to be recorded with the, with the county clerk, and those are public records. Okay. They're out there. So okay. I'm not sure of the specific circumstance Maybe you that you're talk talking a little about. More yeah. other, about the particulars of that circumstance. Sorry, we don't know more about that particular case. Um, yes, yes, please. I wonder if you can sort of like share with us in terms of outcomes of all these, you know, requests for information on the sense that from your own experience, what has been one request that really made a significant difference? And in the sunlight, you know, uh, or sunshine has been around since 2002. I'm just wondering if you can reflect if you've seen changes in, you know, government official behavior or anything else. And how do we measure the efficacy of that other than just the idea that government belongs to the people and therefore we should have all this information? Good question. What are we getting for all this, Bill? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, definitely you can see a value from releasing more government information. I mean, you know, on the on the FOIA front, um, you know, there's a project right now at the Center for Public Integrity where they got Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services data, and they, which, they, again, they got this through a Freedom of Information Act request. They've been able to analyze that data. They've been able to identify patterns of fraud and uh, money misspent and really do a tremendous amount of analysis and also just actually find out with these two hugely expensive federal programs how they're spending the money, where it's going, and that's something that I don't think that average citizens, you know, have any way to grasp until uh, Center for Public Integrity did this work. The Wall Street Journal did some similar work. So kind of understanding what's going on in the federal government, I think, is like a hugely valuable thing. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing in terms of, of government is that, um, you know, that with, you know, and again, we complain a lot about the open, um, you know, open government uh, initiative of the Obama administration, but it, it has resulted in more data being out there, including like valuable data. You know, a lot of the weather data that's been released, uh, you know, for uh, sites like weather.com that make it much more valuable and accessible to the public. Um, so, you know, that's one, one spin off, so, um, which is very important. And, and finally, you know, as, uh, you know, going forward, you know, we have this huge health care bill, we have the Dodd-Frank, I think there's been more openness and transparency around those two, um, uh, those two bills, at least as far as implementation, especially with Dodd-Frank, you have them posting, you know, who they're meeting with, mm -hmm. uh, when they're meeting with bankers, when they're meeting with, um, you know, insurance and investment brokerage officials. So you can kind of see the record of those meetings. Um, I mean, I think that, that those are all huge steps forward. I mean, what we'd like to see is more of that codified into the law, and again, that becoming the presumption. But I was talking to Marion Nesbitt, who runs OGIS the other day, uh, it's the, the ombudsman for FOIA, and she says that one of the things that her office is doing is working with government agencies going forward is that when they design systems for keeping records, make the presumption that you're going to have to release this information when you design these systems so it's easy to do and you don't have those you know, $1,000 FOIA fees or $10,000 FOIA fees that because, you know, the documents are so uh, in such a state or the data is in such a state that you have to go through every single record before you can release it. Yeah, and I'll just say no, nobody knows what mischief might occur if right. public officials di didn't think somebody was watching, but my gut tells me that it matters. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of success uh, stories in, yeah. that, in that regard. No, no, I mean, they're, they're, you they're, know, uh, even in Pennsylvania, I mean, some of the right to know law requests have revealed um, an agency that had in-house lawyers spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on outside counsel, uh, you know, an agency, you know, we've, we've seen, uh, we've seen, we've learned from a right to know request, <laughs> citizens, uh, you know, a little league coach who was stealing from a fund, uh, legal bills, um, you know, you see a lot of success stories in, uh, there was a city that was given a million dollar donation, an anonymous million dollar donation, that came out through a right to know law request. Uh, and yet the city was uh, talking about how broke it was to, to, for this particular expenditure. And we've seen situations where people have been, a right to no law request revealed people retained on a payroll after they've been fired for several months. I mean, there's a lot of success. A, a, a lot of specific this. kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. mischief has been uncovered. Let's, let's get to one more question we're running late. And um, yes. Hi, I'm a writer at the newspaper at the University of Pennsylvania, and obviously a lot of what we deal with is university administrators who are not public officials. 
um, and they can be kind of tight-lipped about things. I'm wondering if you have any advice about getting um, records about kind of private, uh, private corporations such as universities um, through public records requests. Well, we just, we, we dealt with this, um, you know, as you know, Penn State is public-private, and so there were a lot of people that wanted uh, records related to Penn State after that whole, after the whole uh, scandal that occurred there, and, and they're not subject to the law. But what some reporters did is did a back door, and by that what I mean is instead of going to Penn State to ask for the records, they would go to the Department of Welfare or the Department of Education or, you know, a lot of different state departments that are subject and say, give me any records you have related to Penn State. And what was revealed in those were funding, uh, you know, grants and and a lot of correspondence that that was that had to be required to be filed with the state agency that you wouldn't get if you went directly to the university. So at the University of Pennsylvania, which isn't subject to the right to know law, be sort of thinking backwards, if you will. What are they required to file with what state agencies that are covered or federal agencies under FOIA? And that might be a back way in. Yeah, they get a tremendous number of grants from, you know, Department of Defense, from Health and Human Services, all over the place. And that's another place to do is look at the federal agencies that are giving them money. You can find it on usaspending.gov, just put in University of Pennsylvania or UNIV of Pennsylvania, and then work your way backwards. Right. We, and, the, yeah, go, just go ahead, to Holly. note, too, um, if you go to the Office of Property Assessment and ask them for information about their tax exemptions, you'll probably be able to find some fun stuff. I know there are a few, there are a few other stuff. questions out there, and maybe some of our panelists will have individual chats with you. Before we break up, I do want to say that uh, this evening happened a lot because of the energy and inspiration of Emma Jacobs. Emma, take a bow, please. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Terrific reporter here at WHYY. I also want to thank Jennifer Wheeler. I don't know if you're in the room, Jennifer, but thank you so much. And our audio engineer, Charlie Kyer. So to Chris Satulo. Mark Pfeiffer, Holly Otterbein, Terry Mutzler, Bill Allison, thank you so much for your insight. And thank you for coming. Thank you.